We present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. Hello, and welcome to the news quiz. We start with a sign spotted outside a London laundrette, read by Zeb Soames. Ladies and gentlemen, drop your trousers here for best results. <laughs> Our thanks to Caitlin Stevenson for having the presence of mind to send us that cheeky business. Now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first on my right, Francis Ween and Edwina Curry. <laughs> and opposite them, on my left, Rebecca Front and Jeremy Hardy. Francis, which department's EU report is something to treasure? It could be the Treasury, I think. George Osborne went to something called the National Composites Centre, whatever that is, near Bristol, with Liz Truss. And uh, that chap with the beard, Stephen Crabb, the one who replaced Ian Duncan Smith, and um, yeah, Truss and Crabb. Sounds like the sort of thing John Whittingsell's girlfriends get up to <laughs> of an evening. And um, Truss and Crab, oh, and the Amber Rudd as well. So it was Truss, Crab and Rudd, rather magnificently. But if only they'd had Jup with them as well, they'd have a complete set. But um, anyway, they all got going at the National Composites Centre, and he said that if we left the EU, he came up with all sorts of incomprehensible algebra... And then, I mean, I jotted down some of the words he used. He said, but dummy variables and exogenous instruments mean that iteratively weighted least squares and so on and so on. Um, they looked pretty miserable, all four of them, and it's no wonder in the circs. Um, and they also they had a big sign behind them saying um, £4,300 it will cost every family in Britain if we leave the EU. And when you read the small print, this was in the year 2030, and it turned out not to be true anyway, because George Osborne doesn't know the difference between GDP per household and household income, so he got in a bit of a muddle, poor chap, but anyway. Um, <laughs> even if he had got it right, it would be a bit far-fetched to suggest that he can foretell to the nearest £100 <laughs> how much they're going to lose in 15 years' time. Not 4200 not 4400 £4,300 exactly. I mean, he can't even get his forecast straight six months ahead of time, let alone 15 years. So it was all a bit um, uh, grim. And then uh, salvation came in the form of Michael Gove retaliating the next day. Whereas George Osborne would be going on about his iterative variables and things, um, Gove came storming out talking about the Habsburgs and the Ottoman Empire and, <laughs> and, and Cat, Catwoman, magnificently, and even Dennis the Menace was in there somewhere. It was fantastic. It was sort of worthy of Boris Johnson read this speech. It was it's been quite interesting seeing Gove and Osborne sort of pitted against each other and somehow having to choose which one of them you like most. And my kids used to come home from primary school having played that game, Would You Rather? And it was things like, you know, would you rather eat vomit or poo? <laughs> I don't know eat, why eat that came to poo. mind this week. <laughs> is, that, yeah. is that like a new show, Eat Vomit or Poo? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, if ever a title had BBC Three written all over it. <laughs> if, if you had to choose between uh, Osborne and uh, Gove, Edwina, which, which direction would you go in? I, I agree with Francis. I think he made a mistake doing all those uh, formulae and numbers and, and all the rest of it, because it's all guesswork anyway. You might as well, for an awful lot of this, just wet your finger and stick it up in the air and see which way the wind is blowing. They're all trying to forecast the future, and actually that's a game that not even politicians have learned how to do. I think, in many ways, the best thing about being in Europe is we can send all our criminals and ex-criminals and old lags and are trying to escape from the police to the... Costa Brava in Spain, and we can get rid of them. That seems to me a very good way of dealing with uh, people who are difficult to us. I thought so, you were going to say to the European Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who else has come out in favour of Brexit this week? Ian Botham, uh, Rosemary West. <laughs> <laughs> most of the presenters on Five Live. <laughs> has H from Steps made his view clear? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's, yeah, that's just a little treat for the last week. That will be the ultimate decider. Um, who else has waded in? Oh, Obama. And Putin as well. They're both, Putin <laughs> loves the idea of Brexit, apparently. Did I invite... Maybe I dreamt that. I'm sure. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a lot of dreams Obama, about Obama, not so much. Obama's slightly anti-Brexit. And oh. ISIS, in one of the pro-EU <laughs> places, it pro said the anti. only people who want us to vote for Brexit are Putin and ISIS. 
I don't know how they consulted ISIS about this, but anyway. <laughs> so that settled. It's a bit like those old Sun front pages where they used to say, Stalin wants you to vote Labour. We've consulted a spiritualist who says that she's... <laughs> Doris Stokes has had a message through from the ether. <laughs> so if we vote out, do you think ISIS might just calm down? Is that, is that all that they want? Because if that's all they want, <laughs> then, then fine, I'll vote out. <laughs> Uh, you shouldn't negotiate with them, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, eight... <laughs> well, uh, preternaturally, this is the series' very own Groundhog Day of a topic, the ongoing story of the EU referendum. So little to say, so many weeks still to say it. <laughs> Both George Osborne and Michael Gove gave high-profile interviews this week for the We're Scared of Change campaign and the Ooh, Let's Just Bugger Off campaign. <laughs> Osborne announced that if we leave the EU by 2030, every household in the UK will be £4,300 a year worse off. Speak for yourself, George. Good luck getting my money out of Panama. Um, <laughs> President Obama has been warned by Brexit campaigners to keep out of the debate, because who needs the view of one of Britain's largest trading partners when we've already heard the opinion of Ian Botham? <laughs> Leave campaigners have suggested a number of models for post-Brexit trade, the Norwegian model, the Swiss model, and the Turkish model, all of which have been vigorously tested by John Whittingdale. <laughs> Two points to Francis. Ed Wiener, why has fast food caused a fast feud? Oh, this is McDonald's. Wonderful. The, the uh, Labour National Council has refused to have a McDonald's stall at the party conference. And in so doing, they have foregone £30,000. Um, the Tories have said, yes, they're happy to have McDonald's, and the Dems are happy to have McDonald's. And they're doing this on the basis that they disagree with the way McDonald's treats its employees. They won't have uh, unions. Meanwhile, up and down the country... Lots of people have been interviewed eating in McDonald's and saying, you know, hands off our hamburgers. Uh, who do you think you are? You, you're supposed to represent the working man and his family, and here we are, we're enjoying a meal out. So it's, it's kind of about fine. Apart from anything else, we've got 50,000 people who work for McDonald's, so you ought to be in favour of employment. And most of the McDonald's places are franchises, so they're small businesses. So you, you wallop everybody at the same time. I mean, the fact is, whatever Corbyn does, he gets attacked. If he'd said he welcomes McDonald's, then they'd say, oh, look, he's taking corporate money. I thought he wanted the big money out of politics. Whatever Corbyn does, he's going to be attacked. If he rescues a baby from a burning building, they'll say, Corbyn is anti-fire. <laughs> Flammable Labour leader shows contempt for one of man's earliest inventions that has brought warmth and cooked food to generations. The element hating health and safety nut also showed disregard for water, praising militants from the Fire Brigades Union for showering it onto the burning family home. And one of his own backbenchers denounced him, Wes Streeting. Wes Streeting apparently went to Cambridge, where he must have read finger painting and play. <laughs> They probably want to hang around a trendy falafel stand. Now, it shows his complete ignorance of the Middle East if he thinks there is something trendy about falafel. If you go to the Middle East, including Israel, you will see lots of people loving falafel. It's the most popular food. It's nutritious, high in fibre and in minerals and in protein. And you can't just go to a Middle Eastern country and say, look at them, the pretentious bourgeois knob with their falafels and their, and their tabooies. <laughs> they want some fries inside them, that's what they want. That was a party election broadcast on behalf of the pro-falafel party. <laughs> Isn't that a kind of condom? <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly fibrous one. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, would, I supported Osborne. When, when Osborne had a posh burger from Byron, when they do very nice burgers, Byron do, uh, he had a posh burger one, one budget evening, and he was castigated. He, he tweeted a picture of himself, thinking, I'll look like an ordinary person. So he put on his hard hat, and he tucked a whip it under his arm, <laughs> and he chowed down on a burger to show that he was ordinary. And, of course, it was a Byron burger, so he was castigated. Why didn't you just go to McDonald's? And you think, because he's rich, and he would be an idiot if he went to McDonald's. And if I was George Osborne, I wouldn't go to McDonald's. I would have unicorn burgers delivered <laughs> by hovercraft to my country estate. I want to speak up for McDonald's. I think they're very good. I really do. They're no, you, you don't. First of all, it's great. <laughs> Honestly, uh, if, you, if you're in a rush, if you've got family, it's the best place to take them. Toilets are if clean once If you eat 42 of them, you're going to give yourself a heart attack, but that's not recommended. You a big McDonald's man, Francis? No. <laughs> I, 
I'm sorry, I, w I wouldn't actually know how to go about it. Um, <laughs> All a, bit, all a bit of a mystery to me, but I know... If people, you found the process difficult, I would genuinely worry for you. I know people, no, it, it is true. It's like never having bought a lottery ticket. I actually wouldn't know how to buy a lottery ticket, and it's terrible. Uh, what else did uh, John McDonnell uh, say this week? He said he supported direct action. Oh, yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes, he called on to all trade unionists to bring down the government, presumably yeah. on the basis that the Labour Party aren't going to be doing it any time soon. <laughs> No, he said he could do it before the next election. You're allowed to do that. I'm not advocating... But when you think about, you know, the big changes that happen, you know, like it was, the poll tax was brought down by collective action and it was the end of Margaret Thatcher and, and then the end of that government after a bit of interregnum when John Major was Prime Minister purely for the reason that he wasn't Margaret Thatcher. He was given a few years' grace. I'm not advocating violence, but, you know, you see the effect of, of like, you know, blazing cars. And so I'm not advocating... <laughs> Have you, have you rioted, Francis, with, with or your, without your MCC tie on? Uh, well, with it on, though, certainly. <laughs> the, the, do, no, I, I wait very politely in the queue in St John's Wood. That's my, the nearest I come to rioting at the, these days because I'm not very mobile. So uh, I can hit people with my sticks, though, if they, if they get too much. Actually, well, um, Michael Foote, the um, old Labour Party leader, uh, who was a friend of mine, he and his nephew Paul at one stage were both using walking sticks because Paul was a bit doddery, um, and, uh, and I used to have lunch with them, and then they'd walk down Charing Cross Road in search of second-hand bookshops, and both of their walking sticks, they'd be arguing, top of their voices, about Hazlitt or something like that, and Michael would wave his stick and say, no, you're quite wrong, Paul, about this, as poor American tourists were sort of knocked, <laughs> knocked into the gutter or into the uh, path of an oncoming taxi, and Paul would say, no, Michael, I'm not going to stand for this. Uh, and pavements, you've never seen a pavement clear so quickly as when you've got two of them with walking sticks. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to copy their example, I think. So it's a form of direct action, I suppose. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Colossally, this is the news that the Labour Party have banned McDonald's from having a stand at this year's party conference, meaning that the only person with bright red hair whose wacky antics bring a smile to the faces of young and old will be Shadow Defence Secretary Emily Thornbury. <laughs> At least McDonald's still have the option to have a stall at this year's Lib Dem conference. There's still just enough space at this year's venue if they don't mind snuggling up against a howling void of existential despair. <laughs> a McDonald's spokesman said, We are disappointed with the decision that has been taken in what in no way feels like a template stock response that indicates they have had to express this sentiment many, many times. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn has had it in for McDonald's ever since they stole his personal motto, I'm loving it, and he was <laughs> forced to change it to these somewhat less snappy, only through solidarity can the international proletariat rise up and throw off the shackles of their oppressors. <laughs> also this week, John Big Mac McDonald said that the era of Labour not supporting direct action is over, as is, one can't help but notice, the era of Labour achieving a majority in the House of Commons. <laughs> He pledged that he and Jeremy Corbyn will always be on the picket line alongside striking workers, unless someone starts singing God Save the Queen, in which case they're off to Mackie D's for some chicken McNuggets and <laughs> as many sachets of barbecue sauce as they can possibly get away with. <laughs> like most people, I'm all for direct action, as long as it has no impact on my life whatsoever. <laughs> Two points to Ed Wiener. Rebecca, whose future is academic? Well, um, all the children who go to any state schools in England, I imagine. Um, this enforced academisation of schools, which is being proposed, was the subject of PMQs this week. And Jeremy Corbyn sort of launched into David Cameron about it because I think he, he sensed blood because there's quite a lot of backbench rebellion amongst the Conservatives about this proposal that all state schools should become academies. And my children go to a, a state secondary school. I, I mention that chiefly because it's one of the few things that gives me any kind of credibility. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to dinner parties, that and the fact that, you know, I belong to an ethnic minority, so I sort of mention it at every possible opportunity. <laughs> um, but anyway, they, they go to state schools. And, you know, there are flaws with state education. Obviously, there are problems. And when you hang around with parents whose children go to state schools, you get lots of complaints. I remember when our kids were at primary school, being asked to go along to a meeting about parents' complaints about homework, and I sort of went along thinking, oh, good, yes, brilliant, because this is ridiculous. Our kids are seven and nine, and they do four hours' homework every weekend. turned out that, in fact, the complaints were that the kids weren't doing enough homework, <laughs> which meant that, you know, I was fully supportive of the state system, but absolutely not supportive of parents from then on. <laughs> and clearly idiots. But anyway... Um, <laughs> so, 
this week, the National Audit Office um, severely reprimanded the, the Department of Education over their financial statement, because not only did they issue it nine months late, which, by the way, at my children's school is a definite detention. <laughs> <laughs> I've never yet come across a single parent who has said the biggest problem with state education today is that I would really like to know what bet Fred would do with the curriculum. It just, <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of privatisation plus dictatorship, like Pinochet's Chile, except there'll be no sports grounds in which to herd opponents because they've all been sold. <laughs> parents should have no say in their kids' education at all. Because parents are idiots. The whole <laughs> point of education is to rescue children from the clutches of their idiot parents. <laughs> parents should be taken hostage when the children start school. People should just mind them until... But there is that system already. It's called public, public schools. schools. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The trouble is that it's not all schools should become academies. It's that all schools will become academies. And the reason that there are rumblings on the Tory backbenchers is simply because, actually, Tories don't like telling people that you've got to do something. Encourage them all. It was dreamed up by Tony Blair, so it's very difficult for the Labour Party to oppose. In fairness, there's never been any record of Tony Blair ever supporting the Labour Party. <laughs> I don't know about academies. I went to see uh, Madonna at the Brixton one, and I, I just... <laughs> I just felt filthy. I, just... <laughs> I, accidentally, I accidentally went to see Madonna at Wembley. And Madonna, it was like watching a dinner lady on a cruise ship. <laughs> Gastronomically, this is the government's plan to force through the academisation of all state schools, bringing to mind the old saying, those who can do, those who can't set the education policy. <laughs> the issue came up at PMQs, where Jeremy Corbyn devoted all his questions to the same subject for the first time since the famous Where Am I? incident of November 2015. <laughs> The Conservatives claim, of course, that academies produce better results, apart from police academies, where the results are ramshackle yet hilarious. <laughs> Personally, I think the government should be worrying less about academies and more about those supersonic wedgies that have left me with a hefty therapy bill and permanent scarring of the perineum. <laughs> if you ask me, it should be like the old days, where all schools were run by nuns, spinsters or widows whose husband had died in the war. Which war? Doesn't matter. Luckily and indeed reassuringly, there will always be war. Two points <laughs> to Rebecca. <laughs> Jeremy, which race is increasingly about race? Zach Goldsmith has decided to round on Sadiq Khan. People say Sadiq, but I was at, um, I was at a, a Muslim charity too, and everyone called him Sadiq, which suggests it's one of those things we slightly orientalise, thinking, oh, I'll try and do it like foreign people. You know, like newsreaders rather over say things. Like that woman Rita Lashar was on the news the other night, and she kept going, the Taliban, the Taliban, the Taliban. And she had a woman from Afghanistan who just kept saying, Taliban. <laughs> But anyway, um, Sadiq, is, uh, he's not an extremist, he's a tooting MP, he's a Muslim, and he's had loads of stick for people he's met, because he's been, he's been a human rights lawyer, he's spoken on endless platforms, he, you know, he goes to lots of events and speaks to lots of things, and, you know, if you go to a lot of things, you end up on platforms with people. I mean, I live in Streatham Hill, and it's a busy station, I often have to share a platform, <laughs> share a platform with Chaka Ramana, and... Um, <laughs> But Sadiq got all this, all this flack, and one of the things he got flack for was meeting a man called uh, Suleiman Ghani. And he's been denounced by Goldsmith and, and by Cameron as being an extremist. You know, you find yourself on platforms, Francis, be careful, okay. with all sorts of people. <laughs> I've been in the same team on Pointless as Diane Abbott. Does that count against me? And we won. <laughs> we won £10,000 for charity as well. So Which is the extremist out of you been... and Diane Abbott, do you suppose? Which do you, or do you... <laughs> well, the one thing that uh, I really have against Diane Abbott, bless her, is she sent her kids to private school. <laughs> Empty for Hackney. Mm. I think the worst Lots thing of socialist is... principles. It's her adoration for Michael Portillo that's the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's like a shower curtain. It's shameless. Like, what is wrong with you, woman? She's so in love with Michael Portilla and so out of luck for so many reasons. <laughs> Come on, Diane. <laughs> uh, what have uh, supporters of Zach Goldsmith's campaign released this week? What uh, have they leopard. <laughs> Uh, 
it was a, actually a song. Because that goes with uh, Gita Ja, uh, which translates as Zach Goldsmith will win, created by the grassroots organisation Conservative Connect, which sounds, well, it sounds like an absolute riot. Um, <laughs> anyone know who else is standing for Mayor of London at all? It's not just oh, the two George horse Galloway, race. who is currently on 0% in the polls, I believe. Is it? <laughs> what is He's it? He's driving around thing? London in a bus with his face, huge picture of his face on the side. Fancy of driving around with your own face, Francis. God, he sounds like an absolute animal. <laughs> <laughs> what is with the hat thing? Because it's the sort of thing that people do when they sort of feel they're a bit lacking and, you know, think, oh, I think I'll do something flamboyant. I'll start wearing a hat or carrying a dog around with me or something. <laughs> it's sort of like a real failed eccentric kind of bargain hunt thing to do, isn't it? Oh, I'll, I'll put on a hat and that will make me look jaunty and a bit quirky. But he too. looked better in the hat than he did in a leotard. <laughs> I suppose he had to weigh that one up before he started his campaign, didn't he? <laughs> he went to his campaign advisors. Hat or leotard, which way to go? <laughs> Yes, we've only bought two selections for you to choose from, George. <laughs> have you done that one, Edwina? The one, the big brother? Oh, no, you did the jungle one, Big brother, one, I haven't you? done. I've done just about all the others. Have you got any more lined up? I enjoy them. Oh, come on, you can't be that desperate, surely. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's no, always I... work at McDonald's. Apparently, they're a very good employer. <laughs> What do you think of the London mayoral election, Rebecca? Do you think it's acceptable or unacceptable? It's, it's acceptable that there's an election. I, honestly, I don't... <laughs> yeah, We can't don't write know. off democracy completely. Not yeah. yet. <laughs> I don't know. It's all sort of passing me by a little bit. Will you vote in it, do you think? Probably. Yeah. Why? Well, I just... What's it to you? <laughs> Mind your own business. I wasn't, I don't, I wasn't I come asking. Come on we... here to try and do jokes and you know be a bit oh. jolly. I don't have to tell you anything about my voting habits. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you who you well, were. You voting. were. That was going to be the next question. What? I think <laughs> Edwina said nobody me. can see into the future, Rebecca. And who, who am I to disregard anything that Edwina says? So I was I was just going to check that you were going to vote. That's all. I wasn't... Why? What have you heard? <laughs> I've heard, and I don't mean to be a gossip, that you really. Really, really don't like democracy. Right, uh... I prefer a dictatorship, obviously. It's, but it's only the uniforms. <laughs> Irrevocably, this is the London mayoral election and the allegations that the Conservatives are playing the race card against Labour candidate Sadiq Khan. The big competition for London mayor is between Sadiq Khan, a son of an immigrant bus driver, and Zach Goldsmith, who once saw a bus as a child. <laughs> Look, Mother, a tin of tired people. <laughs> While the race is focused on Khan and Goldsmith, we shouldn't forget the Lib Dem candidate, an old tyre tied to a tree. <laughs> And at the end of round one, the scores are Rebecca and Jeremy have four, but Francis and Edwina are in front with six. We start round two with an email about upcoming events at a Hertfordshire social group. The first meeting of the Erotic Writing Group will take place on April the 18th. Please use the back entrance. <laughs> well, thanks to David Brown for forwarding that. Um, Francis, what story are we all gagging to talk about? It's a case called PJS, the News Group Newspapers, which is The Sun... And there are so many celebrity injunctions, privacy injunctions these days, that there's a team of people at the High Court who have to make up these three-letter disguised names, these anonymizing names. And they're, they are quite odd if you look at them, as I spend a lot of my time studying injunctions, seeing if I'm involved in any of them. And, um, <laughs> and so you look at these things. And so when I was reading the judgment on Monday this week, the appeal court judgment in PJS, and every time I saw it on the page, it looked like PJs. Except, actually, it was clear that PJs weren't being warned for what they got up to because the only <laughs> detail we're allowed to know is that it involved olive oil in a paddling pool. But anyway, PJS... It's a lot of olive oil. It is a heck of a lot. I do wonder if they skimped a bit. I mean, that would be unbelievably expensive. You, you'd think you'd tip a bit of sunflower in when no-one was looking. <laughs> economise, economise a bit on the oil. Um, and you should PJ... fry in a paddling pool anyway, because the rubber melts. <laughs> yes. Uh, and PJ's had a threesome, a celebrity threesome, as it's known. But at this point, the poor old anonymizers at the High Court just gave up. Their imagination fell them, and they've called them A, B and C, D. Pathetic. <laughs> so A, B, C, D and PJS um, got on with their olive oil, and then the Sun found out about it when A, B and C, D went to the Sun some years later. 
and uh, it's injuncted and it's been appealed against. I'm going to I'm going to say who it is. I'm going to say who, it, who the three people are. It's me, Emma Thompson, and Joan Bakewell. <laughs> I mean, it was Lucky great. Lady. <laughs> Lucky. I mean, the really irritating thing about this is we're all paid for it. The Supreme Court and uh, all that, the Court of Appeal and everybody else, that's all public money. I'm... It's probably cheaper than the olive oil. Well, now, this, <laughs> this is what they get up to when Michael Goh, who's the Justice Secretary and responsible for that and supposed to be cutting budgets all over the place, is off doing Brexit and goodness knows what. Michael Gove, stop messing around with Europe, get back to your job, you've got a job to do to stop all these idiots spending our money on loads of judges at the Supreme Court. I don't give a toss who it is, I really don't. I actually wrote down here, celebrity threesome... Is that your diary, children. Edwina? <laughs> Do you think this could spell the, the, the end of the super-injunction? This, this well, these are super-injunctions. I coined the word super-injunction, as the OED will one day testify. Uh, so I know what they are, and they're not this sort of injunction. They're much more severe. You can't even say that the injunction exists. That's what a super-injunction is, whereas these are mere common or garden privacy injunctions where you called each other X, Y, Z and MJ3, uh, <laughs> R2D2 or something. <laughs> Dear old um, Whittingdale, uh, the culture secretary, meanwhile, while all this ludicrous stuff about celebrity threesome is going on, saying uh, the world will end if the papers are allowed to print this, and the newspapers saying the world will end if we're not allowed to, quietly John Whittingdale has been getting on with having this tremendous love life, and then finally it comes out and issues a statement saying... Oh, yes, it, uh, it was a bit embarrassing, really, wasn't it? Uh, but there we are. And uh, it's spectacular. I mean, it's, it's always, with Tory MPs, in my experience, and I have some experience, it's always the slightly dull-seeming ones who are the tigers in the sack. Absolutely. <laughs> Just checking. Glad to have that. <laughs> it's, called, it's called camouflage, Francis. <laughs> What are you fixated on, I'm, Rebecca? I'm just fixated on the olive oil, because that's a detail that I... Ha- I mean, clearly I've Googled it, everybody has. Um, <laughs> olive oil didn't come up in my Google search. Is that not a fire risk? I mean, if this paddling pool was outside, so then you've got the sun beating down on this paddling pool. And if pool, they overheat. A certain amount of friction. I mean, I'm really... This is worrying. Yeah, what we, <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> health and safety gone days. mad, this show. <laughs> <laughs> what we it's haven't found practices. out yet is whether it's extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> Now, there which... might have been people with fire extinguishers um, on standby, as well as St John's ambulance. Does that would dampen the ardour a bit, though, don't you think? I don't oh, know. I'm it depends what not. they had in the fire extinguishers. If it was like the strawberries and cream incident. <laughs> is, is dampening the ardour a technical sexual term, Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> not tonight. So. My ardour's been dampened. <laughs> Provocatively, this is the ongoing drama surrounding the celebrity injunction. Is it going to be lifted? Is it not going to be lifted? Until then, we're all just speculating about who we think it is. It's like a very tedious game of guess who, where if you win, you get imprisoned for contempt of court. (laughs) The injunction is apparently in place in an attempt to prevent the children of this celebrity finding out the details when they grow up. And the last thing you want is to be confronted in later life with a revelation like this, when you've only recently been appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. (laughs) Personally, I think people's private lives are their own affair. What a man does in his own house dressed as a beef-eater straddling a rocking horse whilst drenched in peach juice is very much a matter for us enthusiasts. Um, <laughs> also this week, there have been further revelations surrounding the sex life of Culture Secretary John Whittingdale, a man who should clearly have a cold shower installed in his ministerial office. Whittingdale visited a lap-dancing club while regulated the licensing of such establishments and failed to declare it. But then it's embarrassing asking a stripper to fish a receipt out of her pants. <laughs> Uh, do you want to book a blank ones, love? Uh, he... <laughs> he also sent one of his girlfriends a picture that he took at Chequers of members of the Cabinet, uh, commonly known as a dick's pick. <laughs> and he went out with the daughter of a Russian diplomat, a lovely and trustworthy girl who was never happier than when she was whiling away the evening photographing official documents for her Moscow masters. <laughs> Two points to Francis. Edwina, have a listen to this. <laughs> Edwina, which one is turning 90? Ah, it's the Queen. It's the Queen, 90th birthday. And, um, you know, long may she reign over us, happy and glorious and all the rest of it. Um, I love the story that was uh, in, I think it was the Times this week. She's got a much better sense of humour than you'd expect. And uh, she was out walking in the woods in Balmoral with her protection chap, her detective, and came across a couple of Americans and they, uh, they got chatting to this old lady and they had scarf and the wellies. And they said to her, um, oh, oh do, you, do you live near here? And she said, uh, 
yes, I, I have a house not far away. Oh, have you ever met the Queen? And she said, no. And she pointed at the detective, but he has. <laughs> What is the point in having detectives at Balmoral if random Americans are allowed to wander? <laughs> the grounds are open to the public. Are they? Yeah, and the beautiful. So you can literally go there and assassinate the Queen, and it's fine. Can pot around and yeah, uh, but this follows a long tradition. Which is, There's a big difference between pottering and longest... assassinating. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Call me old-fashioned. <laughs> But I like to think there are lines and lines. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's the longest-serving British monarch we have ever had, and she's still probably given her mum's genes another 10, 11, 12 years to go, so she'll be with us for a while yet. But uh, Queen Victoria used to do the same. There's a story of Victoria with John Brown, who has had a ghillie up in the Highlands, and uh, they used to go for picnics, park the carriage, and, and he'd put out the blanket and put out all the goodies and so on, and again, party of tourists found them. And um, he sort of held them some distance. And they said, um, what does Her Majesty eat? What does she have for her tea? And he says, no, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know, does she have scones? Or what? No, she has whiskey and biscuits. And I just love the picture of that sort of stiff-backed old lady getting absolutely sozzled in the heather, on the blanket. Then what happens, Edwina? <laughs> I was fascinated they said that she was going to go walk about, and I watched it. It was nothing like the film at all. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's for the best, but she spent the afternoon in the outback of Windsor or, uh, or, or um, saxe coburg Gotha, as it used to be called. <laughs> but the thing is, I mean, we all want the Queen to live for a long time because of Prince Charles, but... <laughs> To say, people say, oh, isn't it mother? She's lived for so long. I think, well, yeah, but when... I mean, no disrespect, but when someone's had a life of extreme privilege and comfort, I'm not that impressed that they've lived for a long time. I mean, if somebody has lived through torture and genocide and famine or being Shane McGowan or Barry <laughs> Cryer, then I think, how the hell are they still alive? But when it's the Queen, you think, well, she's not going to fall off a ladder trying to clean out the guttering, is she? Let's <laughs> Impressive that she's got to 90 and she's still in full time work because that's very much sort of, you know, setting out how it's going to be. Because she's got no pension. She didn't plan. She didn't. <laughs> if she, at the age of 21, she'd taken out a pension like a sensible young person, she could have retired years ago, instead of which she's trapped in an endless cycle of waving. <laughs> how did uh, the, the, the Queen celebrate her, um, this particular birthday? Anyone Nando's. <laughs> Anyone, anyone know, Francis? Would you keep a... Uh, well, she, uh, Prince Charles threw a dinner for her, is that right? After she'd been walkabout. She then went lie down, I expect, and then she had to have dinner with her family. Um, no doubt they were reading the papers. I mean, the amount of guff they had to fill them with. The Express had a teaser on the front page saying, inside, why the royal family call the Queen the boss. She thought, well, I think I can guess that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love how these events bring out a sort of rash of... Witchling as well from us all. You know, we all start going Nicholas Witchell, don't we? And <laughs> using words that we would never normally use, like personage <laughs> and Baruch Landau, <laughs> majestic. You know, and everybody sort of talks in that slightly hushed way. Oh, she is marvellous. She is marvellous. Well, she is, you know, she's impressive and she's 90 and all of that stuff. But um, yes, it does rather, don't you think? It sort of brings out that toadying fawning of us all. We all go a bit bunting heavy. <laughs> But Witchell did a quite a funny interview with, with Wills, and he sort of said, which, between your father and, and your grandmother, who is the greatest inspiration for you? And Wills just said, oh, the Queen, definitely. Oh, definitely the Queen. Not me, Dad. Oh, God, hands down the Queen. Not that barking, gagging, tree-hugging looper. <laughs> Not me, Dad. <laughs> but I thought it was quite sweet, because they, they sort of said, well, you know, it, Witchell sort of said, but what do you say to those people who say you're rather feckless, lazy, work-shy... Parasite, almost. And he, 
he's all, he said, well, I want to spend a lot of time with my young children, you know, dressing them up in weird clothes so they'll be traumatised. And I thought, well, that's fair enough. You should spend as much time, given that, you know, you're rich and you can, just spend a lot of time with the kids. But then he said he takes his job with the air ambulance very seriously. I thought, oh, don't, don't be, don't have a... It's like, it's like Marie Antoinette pretending to be a milkmaid. Don't have a job. But people say, oh, isn't he lovely? Look at him. He's like an angel of mercy, isn't he, up there? in the East Anglian air ambulance. I think he is the Duke of Cambridge. It's not, it's not much to expect that occasionally he swoops down onto the M11, rescues some of his underlings <laughs> as they crawl from the wreckage of mass pilot. <laughs> uh, do you know what else he said during his interview, Prince William? He said he'd been given a bollocking. He said exactly that. He's, uh, his cousin, Peter Phillips, uh, after riding a quad bike at Balmoral, he said, we were chasing Zara around, who was on a go-kart, and Peter and I managed to herd Zara into a lamppost. And I remember my grandmother being the first person out at Balmoral, running across the lawn in her kilt. She came charging over and gave us the al- most almighty bollocking. It's, it's, a, it's like somebody telling you their dream, isn't it? It's a kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Calorifically, this is the Queen and her celebration of 90 glorious years. On the big day itself, the Queen was presented with a birthday cake, saw a 21-gun salute, and then lit a beacon, followed by bowling, chicken cottage and bed. (laughs) (laughs) The Queen also opened a new guided walk, which connects 63 points of significance in Windsor, the castle, St George's Chapel, and the UK's only branch of millet that specialises in selling tents to maniacs for use on the pavements outside royal occasions. (laughs) A specially commissioned portrait for the occasion presents an angelic-looking Prince George, side-parting long socks, a ribbon-trimmed shirt, poised and ready to join the daily family rendition of Das Deutschlandlied. (laughs) The celebrations will be rounded off by the ceremonial administering of the birthday bumps. Uh, So fun at school, but by the time you're 90, you're receiving quite a pummeling at a time in life when you're least well-equipped to weather it. Either way, violent tradition is violent tradition. Back off, Brussels. Um, (laughs) The Queen will also be having dinner this weekend with the Obamas. Don't know what's on their menu. I assume the Queen's having coronation chicken, while the Obamas will be swallowing a series of remarks directed at them by the Duke of Edinburgh. (laughs) Two points to Ed Wiener. Jeremy, who didn't find being attacked a hoot? Well, I guess we have to address this story. Uh, it's obviously it's a duty of Britain's, you know, Radio 4's flagship satirical programme. We can't get round it. Um, <laughs> difficult though it is, it's the man whose bald head was attacked by an eagle owl. <laughs> he thought that um, by being bald that he could be mistaken for an egg, even though a bird's egg and a man's head are somewhat different in size. But I suppose, I suppose hovering birds are often quite a long way away and might not understand perspective. <laughs> to Aeschylus, though, didn't it? An eagle. Was it an eagle or an owl? Eagle. Owl in this case, eagle in Aeschylus's case. Apparently attacked him. You mean Prometheus him. as well? I think he got, he got his stuff pecked out, didn't he? God, I'd love to pretend I'm not out of my stuff pecked depth. out? <laughs> it's taken years of investigative reporting by Michael Crick to bring this... <laughs> to bring this to the forefront. I mean, it's good that we know this. Because you think, if it, ha- if it hadn't been for a plucky reporter having the energy to research this, we would never have known this. Just I mean, shows what they can get away with. Edwina, how, how worried should we be about this sort of thing? Do you think it could be the start of a kind of... <laughs> Owls are nocturnal, aren't they? Aren't they supposed to be doing That's what this they want you to think. <laughs> it was four in the morning. I mean, I'd call that night time. What was this gentleman out doing at four in the morning? With his bald head. <laughs> No better than he ought to be. Bald head and no knickers, if I'm not very much mistaken. <laughs> he, he, was on, he was on the way to work. There, there's nothing you can say about an owl attacking a man at four in the morning on his way to work. Well, you could it? condemn it, Edwina. <laughs> or you could come out in favour of it. <laughs> Well, heroically, this is the story of Exeter resident Richard Clevedon Smith, who was walking across a park at 4am when an owl swooped down and attacked his bald head. A sad story, but then this is the kind of thing that happens when you try to disguise your hair loss with a wig made of mice. (laughs) I'm normally great with birds, said Mr Smith, before stepping on a moorhen and accidentally kicking a mallard into a nearby (laughs) woodchipper. He said, although having the owl go for my head was terrifying, in retrospect, I'm just glad he didn't notice my exposed penis. (laughs) No-one came to Mr Smith's aid, with most passers-by assuming that it was filming for the latest high-octane series of Ross Kemp on owls. (laughs) Ultimately, this is just yet more collateral damage in my ongoing and, I think, justified attempts to train an animal to assassinate Sir Patrick Stewart. (laughs) 
two points to Jeremy. Before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Francis. Yes. Uh, John Hunter sent this from the Crawley News, and it's local journalism at its finest. The headline is, Break in at Shed. <laughs> a shed in Warnham Road was broken into at some point last Wednesday night or Thursday morning. It is unsure at this stage what, if anything, was stolen. <laughs> Uh, we will keep you informed of any <laughs> further updates. Uh, Edwina. Uh, this is from the Hunt Post in 16th of March, sent in by Jane Howell. I love this one. Deborah Richardson, previously an independent member of St Ives Town Council, has now switched to the eccentric party of Great Britain. Deborah, known as Lady Jezebel Fortescue Luxury Yachts, has several key policies. Draining swimming pools once a week for non-swimmers, fighting obesity by adding superglue to lip balm, and making shoppers wear clown outfits to cheer people up. Lord Toby Judd, party leader, said, it's a massive achievement for the party. It's a great step forwards, a great step sideways, and a great step backwards. We are a very confused bunch. <laughs> uh, Rebecca. Uh, this was sent in by Chris Bennett in Dorchester, who received this letter from Cooperative Funeral Care. I wanted to inform you that we will soon be relocating our offices. Our new stylish funeral home is almost complete, and we would welcome the opportunity to show you around when you are next passing. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy. Miles, this was sent in by Natalie McGillivray. And it's from Lim Life. A seriously injured Lim woman lay in the street for more than an hour waiting for an ambulance that never turned up. The North West Ambulance Service said they are investigating the cause of the delay and this will take up to eight weeks. <laughs> Thank you. And now let's take a look at the final score. Rebecca and Jeremy have eight, but this week's winners are Francis and Edwina with 13. <laughs> Before we leave you, here is an update from the job section of the Bookseller Weekly magazine, sent in by Toby Marshall. Mantle Books have announced that senior editor Sophie Orme will not be returning from maternity leave after an internal restructure. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. <laughs> Taking part in the news quiz were Francis Wien, Edwina Curry, Rebecca Front and Jeremy Hardy. In the chair was Mark.